thanks everyone for joining the Glaze webinar today. Uh, I'm really excited to be hosting this, this talk. I'm actually going to be just on the background of Find the Wall here. Uh, today we're promoting a discussion. It's more, not really a round table, but a, a presentation of a new topic uh, that Mark, Shu Yang, and Bruce are going to be talking about. And we would like to have your interaction today. So today is going to be a little bit different from the other webinars where we have the questions submitted on the Q&A box. Today, the presentation is going to be shorter. We're going to have more time for interaction. And you, if you can use the raise your hand function here on Zoom, we will allow you to speak at the end of the presentation. So we can have the discussion between the audience and the speakers. So really excited to do that today. So we start by uh, introducing our speakers and the topic. Today, uh, we have here Assistant Professor Shuyang Zen from Texas NAM, uh, Professor Mark Van Yersel from University of Georgia and Professor Bruce Bugby from Utah State University. And today they're gonna be talking about the extended photosynthetic active radiation or they're calling EPAR, uh, evidence for photosynthetic activity of PAR radi red photons. Um, during this call, uh, sorry, during this presentation, the three of them will present some of the recent scientific findings uh, related to the EPAR, uh, make a case of why they should be considered uh, into, why you should extend the definition of PAR and what are the implications of not doing that. Uh, the three of them also publish an opinion article at Frontiers in Plant Science this article is freely available, accessible to anyone. I'll be sharing the link for this article here on, the, on our chat box. And it is named, Why Far-Red Photons Should Be Included in the Definition of Photosynthetic Photons in the Measurement of Horticultural Fixture eff Efficacy. So really excited to have this talk today. Uh, with that said, I will give the word to the three of them. I will mute myself, be quiet. And then we're gonna be resuming here for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, just two quick things here. Questions gonna be at the end of the talks. So the three of them will talk and then we have the Q and A at the end of the session. And this presentation is being recorded and will be available at the Glaze webinar uh, page at glaze.org for viewing sometime next week. Thanks everyone. And we can get going. Okay. Um, thank you, Erico. And um, I have one more general announcement I would like to make just as a heads up, um, you will receive a survey after this webinar uh, to get feedback. Um, that is part of the assessment that we do as part of uh, Project LAMP. Um, Erico mentioned the opinion article that Shu Young, Bruce, and I co authored. So you can see that on the screen right here. And um, the work that we have done related to far red was sponsored by a USDA project and a NASA project at Utah State as well. So um, what we will do today, um, and I'm not sure why you see this, hopefully, presumably you see the same green line on the screen that I have, I'm not sure why. Um, what we will do today is briefly cover some of the historical background behind the definition of part of part. Uh, Shu Young will then talk about our recent science, and Bruce is going to talk about the implications of this research. So the action spectrum of photosynthesis has been studied for a long time. This is all the study on higher plants from 1937, which you can see at the top right here. Um, and then hey, the more. Hey, Mark, I'm, on my screen, the right-hand side of your slides is cut off. I, anybody else see that? Okay, let me try a... Ah, there we go. That did it. It's, it's fixed. Okay, that was magic. Okay, um, that was easy. Um, so the oldest study on the action spectrum of photosynthesis on higher plants, as far as I know, was by Hoover in 1937. Um, more well-known studies from McCree and Amanda in more recent history. And overall, the spectra are reasonably consistent, although you can see that Amanda especially shows a very sharp drop-off of photosynthetic activity of light above a wavelength of 700 nanometers. Um, 
all three of these studies have the same basic shortcomings, and that's not criticism of the work, that's just a limitation of uh, what they were able to do. And that is, A, all of this was measured at very low light levels, and B, this was done with single wave bands. So potential interactions among different wave bands of light were ignored in all of these studies. Um, so people think that the definition of uh, PAR actually came from McCree's uh, spectrum of photosynthesis, but a year after he published that, Keith McCree published this paper that was probably more influential in actually establishing the definition of PAR. Um, he compared the different definitions that were in use in the early 1970s and determined which of those definitions best matched Lee photosynthetic data. So um, basically what he did is he measured photosynthesis on uh, a wide range of different light sources um, that are listed across the top here, all different lights, um, what they are, doesn't matter all that much. And he calculated the photosynthetic rate of a range of different species per uh, unit of light that was plants received and then normalized it all to sunlight, which is in the first column, which is one because of normalization. So the definitions that he looked at were two different definitions that measured light in watts per square meter with different wave bands. Um, and then micromoles per square meter per second of incident light on the leaf versus absorbed light. So that would be quite a measurements of leaf absorptance. And for growth chain of plants, he also looked at lux as a potential measure of photosynthetically active radiation. And what he found, not surprisingly, because for the synthesis as a quantum driven process, is that measuring light intensity in micro Einsteins or micro moles per square meter per second um, was the, better, the best way to do this. Um, and so he suggested that this definition be used. There was surprisingly little difference between measuring incident versus absorbed light. Um, and so measuring incident light is much easier. Lyca subsequently developed um, in this quantum sensor that became very popular. So now there was a proposed definition of PAR, a sensor to measure that PAR. And the, uh, this definition quickly became very, very common. But what is also important to think about is what did Keith McCree not do? He did not actually try to figure out what the best possible definition of PAR would be. He only compared definitions in use at that time. And best I know, nobody has ever done a study to actually try to determine what the best possible definition of PAR is. And so before Keith McCree did all of his work, the Emerson effect was already uh, pretty well known. And in textbooks, it's often illustrated with this pretty simple diagram where if you provide far red light to leaves, here you got a pretty low photosynthetic rate. Then you provide red light, you got a pretty low photosynthetic rate. But when you combine the two, there was synergism between the red and far red light, and you got a much higher photosynthetic rate. Interesting to note, though, is look at the range of uh, far red light that Keith McCree, uh, sorry, that Robert Emerson actually used, 675 to 700 nanometers. Very different from what we would consider uh, far red light uh, today. The other thing that is important to point out is that Robert Emerson did not measure CO2 fixation, but instead he measured oxygen evolution. And in his time, those were largely considered to be synonymous. Um, and just to illustrate why they are not the same, so the oxygen of photosynthesis comes from photosystem two. And so really what Amazon was measuring was activity of photosystem two by measuring the amount of oxygen that was being produced. Um, so that is not the same thing as um, CO2 fixation or photosynthesis. Um, and so the Emerson effect is largely remembered um, <clears throat> as um, far red light being photosynthetically active as long as you add shorter wavelength light to it. But for, for some reason has been largely ignored is what Emerson also showed is that if you add far red light to shorter wavelengths, 
those shorter wavelengths can be used more efficiently. But this has been largely ignored until a few years ago when Xu Yang Zhen was a PhD student in my lab and she started working on this topic. She is gonna take over and um, share the findings of her research in this area from the last four or five years. Xu Yang, it's all yours. All right, um, I'm going to quickly go over a series of studies on the photosynthetic value of far right photons. So over the past five, six years, uh, we have studied the effects of far right at photosystem, single leaf and plant canopy level uh, from short term uh, photosynthetic responses to long term crop growth and acclimation in diverse species. In addition to responses under electric lights, uh, our most recent work also looked at the effects of far right uh, in sunlight. So because we wanted to have as much time as we can um, for questions and discussion, I'm only going to present the most important findings from each study. Uh, in the first study, we looked at how supplemental far right affected uh, photochemical efficiency and leaf photosynthesis under commonly used LED grow lights. In this case, a red and blue light and a warm wet light. Uh, we used um, uh, lettuce as a model crop and note that the warm wet LED contain a small fraction of far right. We first did a light response curve under red and blue light, and we found that photochemical efficiency decreased with increasing light intensity, and this is a common response. But adding far red increased photochemical efficiency by about 7% on average across all the light intensities. And we saw similar uh, trend under warm wet uh, as well. What we also found was that at eco PPFD, plants were able to use the warm wet light more efficiently for photosynthesis. And we think at least part of the reason for this was that the warm wet light already contained a fraction of far right. So the take home um, and uh, the, the increased um, photochemical efficiency by far right also translated uh, into higher uh, leaf photosynthetic rate. And then the take home for this study um, is that we can actually make the commonly used um, LED lights more efficient for photosynthesis by including some far right photons. And because the far red LED we used in this study had a relatively broad spectral output, the next question we had uh, was which wavelengths of far red actually uh, increase photochemical efficiency. So we applied photons from 678 to 752 uh, nanometer. Uh, using laser dials to a background of red and blue light. And the dashed line in this graph uh, indicates the photochemical efficiency of lattice under 200 micromole of red and blue light. We found that uh, adding photons from about 686 to 732 nanometer increased the photochemical efficiency. Although the, the wavelengths, the, the shorter wavelength photons in this region tended to be a little bit less effective. But as we move above 752 nanometer, we no longer see any enhancement effect. And the gaps in the figure uh, were simply because there were no available laser dials. And what we conclude from this study uh, is that the upper wavelength limit of photons that enhance photochemistry falls somewhere between 732 to 752 nanometer. 
And next, we scaled up from single leaf measurements to uh, whole canopy responses. And we measured canopy photosynthesis uh, under cool wet light supplemented with far red. Uh, here we have photosynthetic photon flux density integrated from 400 to 700 nanometer. And the canopy photosynthetic rate of lattice increased with increasing uh, wet light intensity. We then added different amounts of far red, and you can see that PPFD barely increased because the far red LEDs we used had very little output in this 400 to 700 nanometer region, um, but photosynthetic rate increased substantially. So PPFD in this case no longer predicts photosynthesis. But if we plot the same data using a slightly different x-axis, so instead of using the conventionally defined power from 400 to 700 nanometer, if we count photons all the way to 750 nanometer, um, you can see that there is not much better correlation between photon flux density and photosynthetic rate. Um, but far red by itself um, is actually inefficient um, in driving uh, photosynthesis. And uh, the effects on photosynthesis is due to the synergistic interaction with shorter wavelength photons. Uh, we expanded this study uh, to look at responses in 14 diverse crop species, uh, including leafy grains, uh, fruiting vegetables, wheat, potato, and C4 crops, corn, sorghum. Uh, we found it's a common response that adding far red photons up to 30% of total photon flux can result in uh, eco photosynthetic activity in the presence of shorter wavelength photons. We then followed this up with long term um, uh, crop uh, growth and acclimation trials where we grow lattice under either wet light or uh, a mix of red and blue light with or without. Uh, far red substitution. What we found was that at harvest, plants um, grow under white or red and blue light had a very similar total biomass production, but plants grown with far red had a substantial increase in total dry mass by about 35%. So we were able to continuously monitor the canopy photosynthetic rate over the entire course of the study. And this graph shows data um, from plants grown under the wet light. Both photosynthesis and respiration uh, went up exponentially over time, um, but plants grown with um, far red outperformed uh, out um, plants grown without far red. And I'm going to zoom in on the data uh, from the last couple of days. So the dips in canopy photosynthesis uh, were when I briefly turned off the far red LEDs for just uh, about 13 minutes. And this again, uh, confirming that um, those far red photons directly contribute to canopy photosynthesis. And we adjusted for the differences in um, canopy leaf expansion and radiation capture and calculated a parameter called canopy quantum yield, which is how efficiently the absorbed photons are used for carbon fixation. And we found that uh, canopy quantum yield was similar among the treatments with or without far red substitution. And this again um, indicates the absorbed far red photons are used equally efficient for photosynthesis as uh, shorter wavelengths, 400 to 700 nanometer photons. So moving on to the last study I'm going to share with you today, we know that sunlight 
has a lot of forward photons. And do those forward photons contribute to photosynthesis in sunlight as well? And to answer this very important question, we use a forward filter um, that removes nearly all photons above 700 nanometer, but only minimally reduce um, PPFD within 400 to 700 nanometer by about 2.5%. Uh, you may also notice that the forward filter also removed a high fraction of UV photons. And to account for this potentially confounding factor, uh, we tested a UV filter um, that's transparent in the power and far right region. And we found that removing those UV photons had virtually no effects on photosynthesis. But filtering out the far right photons caused a uh, six to 7% decrease in leaf photosynthesis in both corn and sunflower under full intensity sunlight. And we saw a bigger reduction in leaf uh, photosynthetic rate under lower light intensity. And this is uh, um, expected because of the nonlinear response of photosynthesis to light. But the biggest effect we saw was under shade. So removing far right actually caused um, over like 30% decrease uh, in photosynthetic rate uh, under vegetation shade. Um, and this is because if we look at the spectrum um, of shade shown in this green uh, graph, uh, under shade is enriched with Far-red photons right, uh, compared to a full spectrum sunlight. And we believe the combined results uh, from all those studies have important implications for the definition of uh, photosynthetic photons, the correct measurements of photosynthesis, quantum yield, and crop productivity. And I'm going to turn it over to Bruce. Uh, to Bruce uh, to discuss the implications in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Xu Yang. Um, I don't have any slides. I'm just going to talk. Um, and I, I want to thank both Mark and Xu Yang for doing a great job summarizing this. The implications for this are, are just enormous. Um, and I want to talk about them in three categories. First, the implications for indoor agriculture and all research under electric lights. Secondly, implications for field agriculture in plant canopies where far red penetrates to lower leaves. And then third, implications for plant ecology, global climate change, uh, photosynthesis all over the planet. So let's start with indoor ag. The most efficient LED on a per photon basis is close to the far red LED. So these far red photons can be added. They're very efficient. They can be added to lights, but of course there's a big disincentive to ever do that because we don't count those as, as photosynthetic. Um, but counting them as photosynthetic helps companies develop better lighting for all kinds of plant growth. And if we're not counting those, even a white LED has three to five, six, seven percent far red photons, which cause photosynthesis, but we don't count them. So we get artifacts from our data, even with just a standard white LED. And high pressure sodium, for example, has about three percent far red photons that we haven't been counting all these all these years. That's indoor agriculture, and that's that's very significant, but that's a relatively small community of plant scientists. Now we go over to agronomy where people are modeling corn photosynthesis and soybeans and rice and wheat. And they have not historically been counting far red photons. So they are under predicting canopy photosynthesis, particularly since those far red photons penetrate deep into the canopy. Um, so it has big 
implications for monocultures of plants in uh, field agronomy and field horticulture too, for that matter. The final significant part of this, it relates to what Xu Yang talk, talked about as study number five, understory crops in forests, any, anywhere where you have multiple layers of plants, these plants are grown on the bottom layer and they have very much enriched far red light. And it's a huge difference for those plants. If you don't count the far red photons as photosynthetic, we can be missing half of the true photosynthetic radiation for those plants. So once we get our heads around this thing, we need to, we're gonna to need to rethink our uh, implications for crop modeling, both for uh, agronomic crops and field crops in general, and our implications for plant ecology. Most of the people associated with our group are very focused on electric lighting, and that's significant, but it's, it's gonna have implications far beyond that. One of the key things I need to mention is, guess what? All of our portable clamp-on photosynthesis meters from multiple com companies now have LEDs in the heads, and those uh, companies haven't been including far red photons. So we get artifacts from our instruments, our clamp-on photosynthetic measurements, uh, until the companies add far red, and particularly far red that you can turn on and off in a gas exchange system. You can see all the work that we had to do. We mean Xu Yang did the work and Mark and I thought about it, but, but um, all the work we had to do to filter those and once the companies get far red photons in their instrument, that'll be enormously better. Now, the first company to do that, it's gonna sell a lot of instruments. So I'll, I'll stop there and we're happy to take questions. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Xu Yang. Uh, yeah, the content is just fantastic. I have a few notes here, but I will Let's open to the audience uh, and then uh, I can bring some questions on my own as well as we go. Uh, so let me remind everyone again, what do we want to do today? If you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, there is a function at the bottom of your Zoom uh, control platform and I will unmute you. So then we can have a conversation today. It'd be more interactive uh, than the normal uh, questions that we normally do. So I see here some questions coming on the Q&A box. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and raise your hand, I can unmute you. I just have to find you. So I found Damon, and I have to keep scrolling back and forth on my screen here. So if you take a second to, to come to you, don't worry. So the first one is Damon. I am allowing you to talk. Damon Arbor, we can hey. hear you. <clears throat> Hi there, Erico. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark, Xu Yang, and Bruce. Um, I see you've studied sunlight with far red in it versus sun, sunlight without far red using the far red filter. But what about the marginal benefit of adding extra far red to the sunlight baseline? How beneficial is adding extra far red? And at what far red content percentage would you expect the benefit of the additional far red to plateau? Do you want to take that, Shu Young? Sure, yeah. So the far red has the sunlight has about 18% far red. Um, that's that's if we only count the far red from 700 to 750 nanometer. So our studies under electric light has shown that having as much as 30% uh, far red as total photon from 400 to 750 nanometer, you basically get an uh, equal increase in photosynthetic rate. So I think there's room to increase far red photon in sunlight because it has 18% that's lower than what we have studied uh, under electric light. I think there, there's room for increase, um, but keep in mind uh, the photosynthetic responses, they were under, they were like short-term uh, measurements. So under long-term acclimation, maybe the effects would be a little bit smaller, but I think you can add a little bit more to it. I don't know if Mark and Bruce will agree with that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. I'm not sure why you would 
want to add even more in sunlight, but experimentally we could do that to, to try and see, uh, confirm the maximum far red. I, I do want to make one thing. I, thought, I saw that Brian Pohl asked about what if understory crops that might get 80% of their photons from far red. And that's certainly possible. Uh, remember, green photons penetrate pretty well in canopies as well. But there's that maximum amount needs to be considered when we model plant ecology. Because for sure, um, there'll be it for some understory crops, they're going to get more than 40% far red photons. So this is just going to need to be refined as we predict photosynthesis of understory crops. I'm very unlikely anything in indoor agriculture, are we going to ever going to give them more than 30, 40% far red photons? That would be that would be enormous. But it is significant for plant ecology. Jen, you are allowed to talk. Hey, hello out. guys. Uh, uh, first of all, congratulations for the work. Very interesting research. I, my doubt is relies on this is very very interesting that the use of far red can, on my understanding, help the plants take better advantage of the rest of the light. If that's I understood correctly of the conclusion of this research, my my question is uh, doesn't if we start to put too much far red. Won't we be uh, triggering uh, shade avoidance uh, responses and stem elongation and things like that that might not be desired? Okay. Mark, go ahead. Mark, go ahead. But that is such an easy question that I can tackle that one. <laughs> um, absolutely. Yes, you will get a shade avoidance response if you add too much far red. Um, but, but the point of the of our research and the opinion paper that we wrote is not about the effects that far red has on plant morphology. It is about answering one question. Is far red photosynthetically active? Yes or no? And the, uh, the answer to that question is a simple, yes, it is, as long as it is combined with shorter wavelengths. So I'm not trying to argue that you should start applying very large amounts of far red light. That's a different research question that we don't address at least, well, it's actually covered in some of the papers, but not what we want to talk about today. I, uh, Greg, you can talk. Let's see if we can hear you. Thank you, Enrico. Um, so I, I had one question about this red, far red plant lengthening effects. And I think Mark just kind of answered that, that that, that was not necessarily the design of, of the experiments. Um, but that, that was going towards that sunlight, sunlight effect. Um, the, um, so my one question was, is that 400 nanometer uh, lower number also correct? Or does that also need to be revised as well? Oh, I'll challenge those of you uh, in the audience here to study that. Although, so Shiyan mentioned that in the last study, she did use a UV filter and saw practically no impact on the photosynthesis from filtering out UV. There is some photosynthetic activity there, and it depends partly on how the plants are grown. If you grow plants under sunlight, plants actually become really good at absorbing that UV light with non-photosynthetic pigments, and it has very little photosynthetic um, activity. Uh, McCree in his 1971 paper actually just uh, showed us the difference between field-grown plants and growth chamber-grown plants. Greg, there's two answers to that. One is the fact that there's way fewer photons down around 390 nanometers than there is at in, in 710 to 730. So even if we don't have that cutoff exactly right, there's not as much, many photons down there. But I would say, and, and I'm now I'm speaking for Su Young, during her time with me, we were looking, because we have LEDs at 402 and 390, we were looking at the cutoff and we largely reproduced McCree's results and, and the exact cutoff is very species specific. Surprisingly, sunflowers start to cut off at 410. They, and, and radishes 
we're still going strong at the 395. So there's, there's species differences down there, but there, four, 400 remains a good cutoff at the short wavelength end. That, that's my quick answer to that. And I welcome uh, any other comments. I would say um, the UV photons, um, maybe between like 380 to 400, they are more uh, photosynthetic than the even shorter ones. And the far red filter and the UV filter I've tested, uh, when we remove the UV photons, I basically saw no effect. Also because the UV filter basically filtered out mostly photons below 380. So the, the, the filter still allow most of the 380 to 400 nanometer photon into the cuvette. Um, so if we completely remove like all the photons below 400, probably you see a small effect. So uh, we have Nada with her little hand raised here on, on Zoom. But before we go bring her live for the question, we get a, we get a nice comment on the q and I want to bring that to discussion as well. Come from Jeff Mostyn saying, would it be better to say that the shorter wavelengths enhance the efficacy of far red making it as photosynthetically effective as the other wavelengths when it alone is inefficient, rather than saying that the more common paraphrasing that far red enhances the efficiency of shorter wavelengths. I think there was a nice, <laughs> nice comment here. What do you guys think about that? I would say no, <laughs> because it's a truly two-way synergy. Not only the shorter wavelengths photons enhanced um, the efficiency of far red, but far red also helped the plants to use shorter wavelengths photons more efficiently. And the photochemical efficiency, the, the measurement we've been making, that's actually how efficiently photosystem two operates. And then far red photons mainly stimulates photosystem one. So by making photosystem one more efficient, you're actually improving the overall efficiency, including photosystem two. And then this, this I think this, um, this thinking probably is also like why Emerson enhancement effect were ignored to begin with, because we thought, well, it's not that important that only far red photons become more efficient. Um, I think maybe Mark can add to it. Oh, I, I completely agree with you. I, um, I think we need to remember that it is a two-way effect. It's truly synergistic. And we should not make the opposite of the mistake that has been made in the past, where it was typically described as far enhances the photosynthetic efficiency of far red. It truly works both ways. Um, and we need to keep that in mind. I think one reason that the, these implications of Emerson's work have not received the attention that they deserve is because Emerson's work got a lot of attention, but it led subsequently to the discovery of photosystem one and two. It was actually hypothesized three years after Emerson published his first paper on the topic and one year after Emerson died. But the Emerson effect became really famous for leading to the discovery of photosystem one and two. But in the process, it seems like a physiologist forgot about the simple synergistic effect that Emerson very clearly showed was present. I think we got distracted basically by the system one and two discovery. This is the, this is the paper, Robin. Go ahead. All right, so uh, to, to this point, Mark, and Xu Yang, you present a very interesting slide uh, where you have, when you consider the wavelengths from 300 to 700 par or 300 to 750 par, that is like, if you understood right, the effects of adding red light from 680 all the way to 700 was very similar to the ones that you have. There's a gap there, and then you have 700 to 730 the effects are very, very similar. So at that time, isn't that enough evidence to say if we are calling those photons from 680 all to 700, if we're considering par, isn't the exactly same effect that you're seeing on, on the a little bit longer wavelengths that we're not calling par right now? 
Uh, you mean with the laser study? Uh, I think that since Emerson basically only tested from about 680, 685 to like 700, 710, he never really looked at like much beyond all the way to 750, um, probably because there were, this, I don't know, maybe they didn't have a uh, good light source available. Um, I, I think I actually forgot what you were asking about. Sorry, can you repeat? <laughs> Let me, I want to be the moderator. We have so many hands raised here. I can go back to this later if I have time. Let me bring more of the people from the audience because I, I know what you find. I can ask you this at any time. Okay. I'll bring more people from the audience here and then I can go back to that. Uh, so I have Nada here. Uh, Nada, I think we, if you unmute, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks again, everyone, for this. This has been really interesting. Um, two questions for you. The first question is, is there any work that's been done on the far red and the impact of the taste profile for indoor farming, so indoor agriculture, any work regarding the taste profile of plants? That's number one. And then number two is for Bruce, actually. Bruce, in regards to your Apogee PAR sensors, the far red, is there a recommendation of how many of those should be placed and how far they should be placed within a facility for indoor farmers? Well, I can answer the, the second part of that. The first part of it had to do with the case study or? No, no, the taste profile, the actual taste of, you know, oh, basil. Taste, and, taste. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh, sure. I can offer my opinions on that, but I'm no expert on taste profiles. I mean, there's, there's bitterness in lettuce, of course. Generally, far red, if it makes leaves expand more, I think it might make them less bitter if I was to make a, a prediction of that. And that would be a very big deal, but that's my opinion. That's not. I don't. I don't. I don't try to do taste profiles of lettuce. Um, yeah, on the Apogee sensors, Apogee because this is coming along. Apogee has one sensor that is a par far sensor. They call it where it gives you two outputs. One is the standard par, and then it has a second output that's just the far red. And then, and then the sensor can also sum those together. And then a separate sensor that's just the EPAR sensor. Um, and, and I think your question is about how, mu how many measurements to take. And that really doesn't change with this the changing definition to EPAR. You want to characterize the light in your facility um, with multiple measurements, regardless of what your definition is. Now, if you add separate far red lights in an indoor facility, there's surely the potential to have many more in one place than another. And, and that's one of the reasons to use a sensor that includes far red photons, because you can characterize variability in far red that you would never see with the standard quantum sensor. So if I understand your question right, I think that's, that's the answers it. Thank you. Yeah, so related to the taste profile, we have definitely not done any work on that, but I seem to recall that Eric Brunkel at Michigan State may have done that, and perhaps in collaboration with uh, Jennifer Bolt, who is in the audience, and uh, Jennifer, um, do I remember that correctly, or is that just my imagination? Hi, Mark. Um, yeah. So Eric and um, his group at Michigan State is looking at the impact of light quality on taste profiles. Um, Roberto Lopez and his former grad student Kelly Walters um, has done some work um, looking at you know, environmental effects with basil and um, that was more focused on temperature and CO2 and then um, Eric is more focused on, on light quantity and, and light quality. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know what the results were for those studies, but there, there is some potential to adjust the light spectrum to um, adjust the, the taste profile. Jennifer. Right, so uh, let me keep bringing the people here. So now I have Nathan. Uh, let me allow Nathan to talk. Nathan, can you hear hey, us? Hey, uh, number one, Erico, thanks for bringing the Far Red Dream Team together. It's awesome. 
Um, and uh, so I had a question regarding um, what we're looking at as biologically active radiation in far red. So we know uh, Xu Yang's study showed that at 752 nanometers, um, that uh, photosynthetic effect kind of dropped off. Um, so what would you tell a, an LED manufacturer um, where should their peak in far red be? A lot of them come out around 735 nanometers. Some of that's going to bleed above 750 and then produce that biologically active radiation, right? That is going to give us more of a phytochrome response, uh, conformational response than the photosynthesis that we're looking for. So would you suggest that they bring that peak down from 735 and is that possible? Nathan, I can speak to that because I work a lot with the manufacturers. First of all, this is not something they can very easily adjust at all. It's the unique composition of the LED that gives that peak at 730 to 735. And with enough basic research and maybe five or 10 years, they could shift it a little. But meanwhile, they're, they're all working on a more efficient green LED. Um, and the, the far reds, already exist, they're very efficient. So it's it's not impossible to shift the peak, but it's it's very difficult, would require a significant fundamental research. But to this question, when Chu Young did her studies with adding far red LEDs, the answer was they are equally efficient to shorter wavelength LEDs. So even though there, there would have been a tiny tail past 750, on average, all of the photons from a far red LED were effective, regardless of exactly where the peak is. So I think that's significant. If, if the cutoff was, I don't know, 740, um, the far red LEDs would not have been as effective as, as we found that they were. But uh, Shu Young, didn't you do a study that did use LEDs with different wavelengths of far red light? I thought you did. Uh, yes, I did. So I think I tested far red with peak at 710, uh, 720, and about 735. I think I actually saw bigger effect with the LED with shorter peak. Um, but I think that was mostly just because the 710 LED had a lot of red light and they were absorbed um, better, if I remember correctly. Just to clarify, those were custom LEDs that we ordered and those shorter wavelength peaks are not as efficient as the 730 wavelength peak. That's the one that's a standard peak that's more commercially available. The, the photosynthetic efficiency of some of these far red photons is actually, uh, and it's quite amazing when you look at the relatively low absorptance of leads in that same part of the spectrum. Um, so per absorbed photon, the far red photons are much more effective actually than far photons. Continuing, Charles, can you hear us? You're on mute right now. Uh, you, if you unmute, Charles Parrish, if you unmute, you're almost, you unmute and mute again. <coughs> I think I have a question here as well. I believe you wrote the question. You wanna try to unmute again? Hey, there you go. all right. Uh, thanks for your talk today, y'all. Uh, so, Obviously, this is uh, some very fundamental uh, changes in our understanding of photosynthetic activity. So what other fundamental knowledge in photobiology, uh, photobiology deserves reassessment with the inclusion of far red in this uh, measurement of photosynthetic activity? You, you, you want to know what we're going to work on next? <laughs> Got it. And that's not a simple question. As, as a general rule, we, we get interested in looking at plant communities of plants. And you know we do a lot of scaling from single leaf photosynthesis to whole plants, plant communities. And some of the things we find in 
single plants don't scale well to plant communities. So it's, it's sorting out those nuances from data collected on single plants to plant communities. I think that's an important question, but it's a lot harder in research wise to study a plant community than it is to just study a single plant. Uh, that's the one topic that really needs much more attention is the importance of far red light for story plants. Bruce mentioned that, and hopefully, once we get our next paper published, that will uh, <clears throat> stimulate more work in that area because I, I do believe that that is a really big deal in ecology that has been completely ignored, really, um, just because the 400 to 700 nanometer definition was convenience rather than scientifically correct. I want to quickly comment on another question I saw in the chat because it relates to this. And the question was, when will the definition be officially changed? And as far as research scientists go, we've already changed. I mean, we already do our research to make treatments equal using the EPAR definition of photosynthesis. So at least for some fraction of the plant biology community, we've already made the change. That then needs to be repeated in multiple laboratories. And one of the groups that deals with this has been the ASABE, which has been making recommendations for lots of things, for, photos, for phytochrome measurements. Um, and that's a group of engineers and, and so far, we're a group of scientists looking at the science, but when the science is really clear, as we think it is, then the engineers, it's, it's the responsible engineers need to look at the new definition. I think we're going to have two definitions for a while. We're going to have PAR and we're going to have EPAR, and, and typically we report both numbers in our publications. Um, but you know, there's not some world agency that puts immediate say, okay, this is official now. There, um, there's not like the CDC or something for uh, photosynthetic radiation. I think it's just gonna be gradual acceptance by the scientific community and then by the engineering community. The engineering community will follow and, and also people that set standards will follow the science. That's, that's an interesting question, right? And also now that uh, lots of people are already reporting PAR and EPAR, but so we're using 700 nanometer as the cutoff. But when you look at Amazon's work, and I think some of the work that Shi Yang and I did as well, suggests that it might be more meaningful actually to report 400 to 680 and then 680 to 850 because the 600, uh, 680 to 750 because the 680 to 750 nanometer, that is where you get that uh, stimulation of photosystem one and where the Amazon effect actually happens. So don't forget that the 700 nanometer cutoff, I think the main reason that we use that because it's a nice round number, it has two zeros at the end, but there is no science that really says that that is the right number. That was my question, Mark, before. <laughs> So there was exactly the question that, that between the 680. So yeah, thanks for getting this one. Uh, and that will be a kind of a follow-up question of mine as well. So extending the definition, right? If you have the synergistic effect between the 680 and the 750, then you, you just consider them the same as the other photons or how we account for that. So I think there's a lot of discussion to go uh, in, in this direction. Uh, let, me, let me bring some more people. Uh, Keep the hands keep getting raised here. Jorge Eduardo, can you hear us? Uh, you can. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Great. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Cool. So first of all, uh, excellent presentation. Um, I've seen uh, different studies, and one of the effects of far red radiation is to increase or to decrease. I think it's increased mainly uh, stomatal conductance. So we may have the Emerson effect. But have you seen in your data increasing stomatal conductance, or maybe that can also be attributed to the increase in photosynthesis? Oh, we have looked at stomatal response. So, or number. Uh, 
Yeah, sorry. sorry. And I could be stomatal conductance, and I think it's also related to stomatal density. I think far red also has uh, some effects on the stomatal density. Yeah, we actually didn't measure like long-term acclimation of how stomatal density changes, but short-term measurements with stomatal conductance that we have looked at. The off the top of my head, I think it's if you add, um, for example, 10% of far red, and then you add 10% of 400 to 700 nanometer uh, photons, you increase by 10%, you get same increase in photosynthetic rate, but the stomatal conductance under the with far red treatment is actually lower. So it does not increase as much as when you increase your Par photon by the same same amount. Uh, that's that's what I can remember. And so, stomatal responses may play a role in this. But in the first study that Shu Yang and I published, um, where we looked at chlorophyll fluorescence, we saw effects of photoelectric light on photosynthetic activity within milliseconds. I mean, the as fast as our instrument could measure, the effect was essentially immediate. So I'm not saying that there could not be a stomatal component to this, but that certainly isn't the only thing. There is very clearly a very direct effect of far red light on um, photosynthetic efficiency and CO2 fixation. I, I might add that in, in all of this work, we've never seen anything that disagrees with the current models of stomatal conductance. For example, the Ballberry model is widely used one of the components in that model is assimilation rate. And so if our red photons yep. increase assimilation, that means the stomates open more. So those are in their indirect effects of far red on photosynthesis. So the effects aren't, aren't in any way caused by changes in stomatal conductance is another way to answer that. Um, Arv, can you unmute yourself? You yes, thank you. Thank you, Enrico. Um, I'm going to try to be quick. Thank you for the presentation, everyone. It was amazing. Um, I'm just wondering if at some point in the future, we also going to have a definition that takes in account how lights impact the quality of plants. So it goes a little bit to the taste question that was asked before. I'm thinking, for example, about um, UVB that reduce powdery mildew, UVA that increase cryptochromes and flavonoids in some species. And those are not taken into account in the EPAR or PAR definition. And I know they are not directly related to photosynthetic efficiency, but the overall efficiency and plant quality is impacted with those wavelengths. Well, I, I certainly agree that I mean, plant quality and, and flavor is obviously important, but we need that there are differences among species and sometimes even cultivars within species with regard to how they respond to particular wavelengths. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting research going on in that area, um, but we need to be careful that we don't confound that research with work on defining photosynthetically active radiation. I doubt that we can ever come up with a let's call it a taste spectrum, uh, a spectrum that can predict the flavor of a wide range of different crops. Seems unlikely to me. Certainly there's huge photobio photobiological effects on plant shape, but that's a, that's a different question. And we could have multiple deep seminars on that. And we already have, but. Hi, um, very interesting uh, presentations. I, um, I have an interesting question to ask, like um, what if you have a plant that is acclimated to um, growth under far red light and then you remove the far red light at the later stage, um, would there be any sound regulation to, already to the photosystem too or like harvesting complex um, in terms of how they harvest the um, PAR photons? Xu Yang, you want to comment on that? Yes, actually, plants do acclimate to the spectral quality, 
normally when you have more or less flower that would change the chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B ratio, it will also change the antenna size associated with photosystem two versus photosystem one, and, and also just simply the ratio between photosystem one and photosystem two. So if you grow plants under far red uh, to begin with, but then later remove that, you're going to change the whole dynamic of chlorophyll A and B and uh, photosystem one, two, uh, stoic chaometry. So that's going to have some, some effects on um, uh, on the harvest of power photons as well. So you wouldn't um, recommend that? <laughs> um, if you have a good purpose, a good reason to do that, maybe you're trying to adjust like the elongation rate or leaf expansion rate or something like that, you could try, um, you should try, you could try change that. Right. Um, can I ask a follow-up questions if I if there's still time? Yeah, sure. can go with one more follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I understood correctly, um far red uh preferably excite the um photosystem one. And by doing so, you reduce the level of light stress that plants um uh, receive. And would it be more sensible that if you only apply far red when plant is under light stress, say like very high light, so fluctuating light, but that, that will be in the field condition instead of like if you have it in the indoor farming. Oh, I have seen a study coming out of uh, a Japanese research group. They actually found under fluctuating light condition in the field, having far right offer photo protection. Um, and indoor condition, when you, I, I think it's uh, indoor farming, like when you have LEDs that doesn't have far red, having the far red photons do enhance the photochemical efficiency. Uh, what's your question whether uh, we should only have far red in the field, not in indoor farming? Right, because if you think about adding um, far red um, into uh, the LED packages, it's pretty expensive. And if you can avoid adding that by just growing plants under pretty low light intensities and the long photo period, then you don't need to add far right to reduce the light okay. stress level. It probably is, it will be, you will enhance the photosynthesis, but it will be a bit more cost effective if you don't add far right. Um, that I don't necessarily agree because far right LEDs are manufactured with higher efficacy than shorter wavelengths photons. So, um, we would say like a lot of times when you add far red, you can reduce some amount of your shorter wavelength photons and there's benefit not only under stressful fluctuating light conditions, even when you have like steady light in indoor uh, agriculture, you can still have benefits of having far red to enhance the, the photochemical efficiency and photosynthesis. Okay. Great. Let, me, let me comment. Let me comment on the economics of that. Far red photons, from a strict electrical standpoint, are perhaps our most efficient LED, even more efficient than red, because they're low energy photons. So that part is terrific. But they are not mass produced by the billions like the other colors. So the cost of a far red LED is five times to eight times greater than say a white LED. So they're more expensive to put in fixtures from an initial capital cost point. But once they're in there, they're, they take electricity to uh, make the photons. They take less electricity to make the photons. And what all three of us have found in our research is that if you replace a certain amount of white lights, with the same amount of photons from far red light, not only does it stimulate photosynthesis, but you get more biomass, at least in lattice, than you would get from white photons, well, photons in the far region only. There is, of course, no such thing as a white photon. Um, yeah. yeah. But far red photons are more efficient in increasing biomass 
than power photons as long as you don't apply them in excess. Yeah, there was a nice slide from Shu Yang on that as well, where she showed the 300 power lighting plus uh, 50 micromoles of far red versus the 350 with everything within the definition of far. Uh, there was a nice, and, yeah. And so that's, you get a combination of morphological effects and physiological <laughs> effects there. And um, we probably a paper earlier this year with a former PhD student of mine, Reed Lejean, where we actually quantified the relative efficacy of far and far red photons with regard to biomass production. And far red was much better. I think uh, we're, we're close here already, a few minutes past. I think one last thing I'd like to mention is that I was thinking some of the implications as well. Uh, so, Bruce made three big buckets, right, of implications ecological, water studies, but the with indoor farming or greenhouses, supplemental lighting. Uh, the HPS lights today, uh, we're already being in a big push for the LEDs, but someone who compare an HPS light with, a, with an LED lighting system, you can measure the PAR, how much under the current definition of PAR, you get the micromoles uh, per watts or per juice. Uh, but the HPS is outputting a lot of far or more far red than the LED fixtures are today, right? And, that will give them an edge. So it's actually disfavorable for the industry uh, with that, even though they're already behind. I don't think that's a matching factor right now, uh, but there is that because the LED manufacturers are on purposely not including the far red light. So they don't get a, a minor or a lower micromole per joule while the HPS, it's there you want or not. So I think that's another implication there for us to think about. So um, excellent. Uh, I think we can maybe, Shuyang, Bruce, Mark, if you have any final comments, we're already 10 minutes past the, the three o'clock here, the one hour mark. Or if one else has any questions, I don't see any other uh, hands raised. Actually, we have one more. Do you guys have time for one last question and then maybe the closing comments? Is that okay? All right, so yeah, we got one here at the last minute. So Russell will, will be the lucky one to have the, the last question. Russell, can you unmute and let us know your question? Russell. All right, maybe we can go with the closing. Well, oh, there you go. There we go. Perfect. Oh. Right the time. <laughs> go ahead, Russell. We, we, no question. No. Why am I doing anything? I didn't ask a question. It's very fade, Russell. Uh, you want to try again? All right, well, let's. I was going to say, Bruce, do you want to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to make one closing comment. It's incumbent on all research scientists to add far red to their photosynthetic photons. When we design studies, they should be included. Um, if you don't, add them to your studies, you're getting artifacts. And we, we can report PAR and plus EPAR. All of us should be doing that in all of our studies to help make this transition from the old definition of photosynthesis to the new one. And that's where it's going to start. When the community of scientists see this and it's reproduced in multiple laboratories, it, it, then the engineering societies will accept it and it'll it'll become a more official definition um, journal reviewers we all review a lot of papers that, that's a that's a, something we should look for in manuscripts too new manuscripts that come out have they considered the far red photons in their research uh, even if it hasn't been quantified do they at least take into account that the far red photons in this research are not for Inactive. And I realize that it, it's a bit inconvenient for many of us to all of a sudden have to change this, but it is simply required to do the best possible science that we can do. And, and I don't think we have gotten much pushback actually related to our science. Um, I have had more pushback on this idea related largely to convenience and having to change. But if in science we don't change, then we're not making progress. Well, in 19, 
70, we had a change from energy sensors to photon sensors be because of McCree's studies. And that wasn't so convenient back then, but that's okay. We, we have sensors to measure EPAR. All right. Well, uh, I think about Shu Yang, any final comments from you? I'm sure. I, I guess it's again, I wanted to emphasize that uh, we're not exactly arguing you should uh, add forward to your indoor growing facility, but a lot of times you have forward LEDs in there and you really need to think about their photosynthetic value. When you have forward, they are photosynthetic and you need to really account for that. that that's it. <laughs> Great, great. Well, thanks everyone. I think there was a fantastic discussion. Uh, I really enjoyed this format. Uh, I think we, we should adopt this format for all the other Glaze webinars. Uh, great interaction. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, everyone bringing the questions here, I think was a very nice discussion, respectful, uh, polite discussion. I hope uh, Xu Yang, Bruce and Mark, you got good feedback from, from that. Uh, and if we can promote more talks like this, I think it would be fantastic. And and Bruce, maybe think about the next steps, like you mentioned, engineering societies, what is next, right? Uh, Mark said about measuring and reporting, doing the good science. Uh, I think great comments from Shu Yang as well, that you're not trying to push anything for the indoor growers, uh, but explaining what's happening. Uh, and hopefully we can continue to promote this discussion. So uh, I think just thank everyone for joining today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion and we see you again in one month from now on the next Glaze webinar. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Erico. Bye-bye.